On behalf of the Victorian team at the Institute of Architects, I'd like to offer you a warm welcome to today's Lean In, Beyond Good Enough, What Is Good Design, which will provide some case studies on how good architecture and the Passive House standard work in harmony. My name is Stephanie Bullock and I'm from Cosloff Architecture and also sit on the Institute's Victorian Chapter Council, and it's my honour to be your host and moderator for today's Lean In session. We're joining from across the country today and we acknowledge with deep respect the traditional owners of this land. We acknowledge that it is a privilege to stand on country and walk in the footsteps, footsteps of those before us, and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. The Lean In session is being recorded, so if you miss anything today or have to leave early, we'll be publishing this recording on the Institute's YouTube channel in the next couple of days, and we'll share that link with you in our upcoming email communications. This Lean In session enables you to ask questions of our panellists, so if you have a question or a comment, please use the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen to add yours in, and we'll go through these with the panellists later in the session. Our presenters today are Talina Edwards and Luke Middleton. Talina Edwards is a director of Envirotecture and is passionate about creating healthy, beautiful, functional, comfortable and sustainable architecture, which combines building science and biophilic design. She's a certified passive house designer and studied for the Living Future accreditation to deepen her pursuit to care for country and cultivate a more regenerative future for all. Luke Middleton established EME Design in 2000, driven by his passion to design beautiful, healthy, efficient and inspiring architecture that aspires to establish symbiotic relationships, design, programmatic, ecological and cultural. In 2006, he completed his first biophilic inspired carbon positive project. Luke's interest in creative resilience has seen him collaborate with certified universities around the world on research and urban design projects. He is a certified passive house designer, has a certificate one in permaculture, and is currently completing his Living Building Challenge certification. Thanks so much, Luke. Hello, everyone. Um... I'm Luke, and firstly, I'd also like to pay my respects to the land that I sit on, the Rwandri land of the Kulin Nation. Today, I'd like to illustrate the versatility of Passive House and the um, variety, by a variety of projects, both Passive House and our pre-Passive House projects. The, um, sorry, I've just got a problem. By looking back, we can reflect. So this, and I hope to illustrate the key reasons I feel Passive House is a natural and necessary progression for the industry. A little context first. I studied architecture after a brief stint in construction. Probably like a lot of you, I had a passion to explore how creative thinking could make a positive contribution to our built environment. I've always been in awe of nature and this naturally fed my interest into the ecological approach to architecture. So in summer of 2000, I established EME Design, short for Ecologically Motivated Environments. At the time, I wanted to ensure our focus and our process was inspired by ecological systems, the broader ecology, and that was encompasses all living things. We managed to establish some relationships with some open-minded clients. We explored design solutions together and sometimes we embedded these low-tech solutions into the projects. We attempted to calculate the benefits of these systems, engaging with experienced service engineers and universities. However, whilst these systems were relatively simple concepts, the computations involved to accurately assess the outcomes were not. This led me down another rabbit hole. In 2006, I met Professor Dominic Hess. Soon we were from Melbourne University. Soon we were collaborating on the recording and analysis of actual building performance for our projects, exploring and comparing actual performance of our designs against other five-star buildings at the time. The research expanded to include post-occupancy monitoring of three of our educational buildings. And we had some surprising results. So over the years, I've aimed for continuous improvement via analysis, reflection, education. I have a training in permaculture, earth construction, passive house, and recently the living buildings. 
Regenerative process and design is where I'd like to head, but I digress. For my first key point for today, you don't know what you don't know. Theoretical performance is just that. During the noughties, we thought we were doing a wonderful job and providing good outcomes for our clients. Sure, they were possibly creating architecture that was better performing than local equivalents at the time, but without a systematic and scientific approach that Passive House provides, we were making suboptimal decisions. Now, Passive House started in 1991 in Germany. The process is extremely thorough and the outcomes have been tested, monitored to verify the computations. So this brings me to my first project that I'm going to talk about today. It's an infill project we did in 2002. As I mentioned, our motivations were, were, were pure uh, and we aimed as high as we could. It's a small infill site, heritage overlay. The site was well orientated with the north, was on the north side of the street. And whilst there's no regulations, we set out to achieve at least five star neighbours rating. We inverted the typical hallway to become a light court with a cool guardy pond feeding light and air into the home. Natural lime render on the Hebel provided the internal finish. Recycled Australian hardwood complemented the hand wall finishes. The entire landscape was permeable and together with a 5,000 litre water tank, the home substantially reduced its reliance on town water as well as the load on the stormwater network. But now we look at the as-built performance under the passive house system. So what we've done here is gone back and modelled the building as it was built. And we can see here that the energy balance, uh, again, these are high level, very rough estimates, but they give us a very good idea of where it was heading of 39 to 45 kilowatt per hour, of kilowatt per metre square per annum, which is well above the 15 required for passive house. So we looked at some upgrades to see what would make it work. So if we upgrade the building, obviously we'd need to bring the air tightness back. We'd need to put in some passive house windows, some wall insulation, some floor insulation, and remove the thermal bridges and bring in the heat recovery ventilation to manage the air quality and condensation. So what can we learn from this project? It highlights that this home could have had risk of condensation buildup and therefore mould. Also the air could have been particularly unhealthy during times when it was closed down for hot or cold extremities. And ob obviously the building would have used significantly more energy. Now, you know, granted, this is 2002. At the time, there was very little on the ground in Australia for Passive House, but I still think it's useful to see how this is affected by the design. And this building, um, you know, at the time was considered, you know, quite, quite forefront. The next project is in Mildura in 2009. The vision for this was part of a Mildura Eco Living Park, which was a similar concept to what's happening, it happens at Ceres in Northcote. Located at a refuge and recycling site, the vision for this place was community-led innovation. We work with the, on the master plan with Ceres and the local stakeholders, including Mildura Council, Sunny Tafe and the primary schools. A big omission, obviously, the uh, traditional owners there. We didn't, um, again, that's a big omission we had. We designed the learning centre, and here's the first concept, sitting the building on three shipping containers elevated above the floodplain. However, the council chose the second option, our less preferred option, to build the land up and use a concrete slab construction. We suggested to add some low-tech energy management systems that would take advantage of the semi-arid climate. So here you can see what we did is we introduced a rock bed plenum to enhance the energy storage that captures the cools during the summer nights and feeds an underground air labyrinth. The winter, it does a reverse. The excess heat is fed into the, the labyrinth, into the, bed, the rock bed and maintains warmth on cold and cloudy days. Here you can see it under construction and the, the, the labyrinth and the, and the, the sub slab works. So again, we've done the modeling We've had a look at the uh, at this how it works, and again, this building uh, had um, yeah 
some, some issues with it. We did have an adaptable skillion roof that consolidated three zones of insulation in winter and basically became a vented parasol roof in summer. But if we look at the modelling, which we couldn't model all of those elements, such as the labyrinth, um, the heating balance was, um, is still way over passive house at six air changes per hour. One thing in particular to note here is that the form factor, because it's a small building, is up at 3.8, something you know all small buildings uh, struggle with. So what did we do? If we look at the upgrade scenario and we tighten the building, we make passive house windows, we can see very quickly that there's massive um, savings in terms of the energy. And the other thing is obviously we have the resilience of the structure ensured because there's no buildup of condensation. So the lessons learned here are that whilst we've only limited feedback from the council on the performance, I think some of the systems that we've designed in to naturally sustain the temperatures internally are working. We can't guarantee that there isn't condensation in that building under extreme circumstances. The next case study, we were invited to put a proposal together and a concept for the Murundaka co-housing group. And uh, it was for 16 homes and a community house. The reason I'm looking at this one is because I think it's important to look at cluster housing uh, because it does have uh, some very good synergies with passive house. Our master plan prioritised community flexibility and efficiency, every home at least eight star neighbour. Stage two involved developing the adjoining sites and creating a full hub, as you can see here in the shaded area. Generous communal spaces included food production and the design was based on three modules enabling many elements of these three buildings and put them onto different sites. The um, three modules were positioned to provide a general communal space between them. This also ensured good winter solar access to the southern homes. The Skillion roof reduces the height to the south and reduces the overshadowing within the site and to the neighbours. Taking the opportunity of the sloping site, the lower ground level is sunken into the, into the land and a crib wall garden bed mediates the level transition. This space satisfies the current requirements for car parking, but looking to the future, when we probably don't have cars, hopefully, this open air undercroft has many functional possibilities. The terrace is doubling as productive gardens or accommodating dwarf fruit trees. The homes also have the option of a compact greenhouse as part of their balcony veranda. But what do we learn when we put it through the numbers? Again, whilst we've got a fantastic form factor, if you see there, you'll see it's 2.16 because of the clustering of the houses together, we're still struggling with the energy balance. Um, it's, it's, we, we have, as I say, this is an estimate, that's why I'm putting a range of 14 to 20 on there. But the cluster really does help. And the fact that we have some fundamentals, right, like good glazing ratios and et cetera. But if we do the pH upgrade, which is not a massive thing, the air tightness, uh, the passive house windows and the heat recovery unit, and a little bit more slab insulation, the energy consumption significantly introduce, it reduces, which is really important for low cost housing, in my opinion, the ongoing costs. And so if we went for the passive approach, again, we would be averting potential condensation. As you bring the insulation up in homes, the condensation risk increases massively, as does the unhealthy air and the structural durability because of that. And Passive House brings performance predictability. The next project is the Ag Hort Centre. Uh, this is the first of two straw bale school buildings we've completed, situated at Woodley School in Baxter. This was designed to engage the whole school in the process. We ran classes exploring sustainability, design, also discussed the multiplier effects of decisions during design phase. The students were eager to collaborate. They helped construct the building. We set to create an open, set out to create an open 3D textbook, and we were lucky to find an inspired group of people at this school. 
we investigated local recycled materials and for the most part, we achieved the objectives set. We incorporated the design of recycled iron bark telegraph, telephone poles, local cypress, radial cut timber, bracing plies, the internal cladding, straw bale with lime render. The windows were made on site by the, by the students. The roof hunched down to the southwest, nestling into the landscape, and to the north it reached up to capture the morning sun. It also provided a natural heat stack for purge ventilation. We designed the roof structure to serve as a shelter while the straw bales were being installed, a process that took months as the students had other subjects to attend as well. Here's the completed building. So again, if we run this, this, this building really is dragged down by its form factor. Um, the form factor, because of the cathedral ceiling and the, and the shape of the extruded shape of the building, it's up over four which really, even though we had super insulated walls, such as the, 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 the straw bale, the building um, still struggled in terms of its performance. So the interesting thing about, whoops, sorry. The interesting thing about this is that it doesn't have heating or cooling. So these fluctuations are just tolerated by the, uh, by the class, but it is a different sort of building being an outdoor activity uh, the ag court nature, possibly not something that would be tolerated for all classrooms. So if we upgrade to air tightness, passive house windows and the heat recovery and the slab insulation, oops, all of a sudden we achieve um, a massive reduction in the uh, energy consumption. The straw bales are fantastic insulation and obviously they're a wonderful low embodied energy material. Now we're moving into our transition. This was our first project during our transition into Passive House. It's a retrofit with non-typical materials and junctions, probably not the easiest project for the uninitiated. At the time, I didn't have my Passive House certification, neither had the builder. A client engaged an external consultant based in New Zealand. In hindsight, a closer relationship would have been useful because flowing through the client, there were things lost. In response to the site conditions, we placed a butterfly roof volume and linked it to the home via a lower roof form that housed the kitchen. The butterfly was morphed to reach up to the north and lowered to the south, thereby enabling good solar access to the rear garden and veggie patch. We didn't quite get this one across the line with the pressure test. Loads of lessons learned. Managing an existing structure really hard. Hardwood is tough and hardwood is rough sawn and hardwood is therefore hard to tape to. So it's very hard to get air tightness there. The installation of the windows, um, again, this idea of having that seamless roof to um, glass junction, troublesome sometimes. The wrap connections to the new and old and the rammed earth, really tricky. And again, the key here was the fact that we didn't have experienced trades or builder made things really, really tricky. It was a little bit um, blind leading the blind, but the things that we learned were tried to take on to our next project and the client still loves the home and it still performs exceedingly well. This is the second project during the transition. Um, this project is in a heritage overlay area. Um, the old home was 70s Besser block with aluminium windows and pretty much no insulation. We looked to retrofit, however, it was really awkward and trying to insulate and make the rooms functional just wasn't going to work. The house to the north cast shadows over the existing to recycle and reuse. Demolition materials were separated. The entire roof was taken by a farmer to build his shed. Ceres got a free solar hot water unit. Um, the design used the whole footprint. All of the slab and all of the strip footings were completely reused and the foot that determined the footprint. And being near, near the Mary Creek, the geology is reactive clay, floaters or bedrock. We estimate we saved 50 cubic metres of concrete and the associated embodied energy. Here's the plan. So we 
had to hug the uh, existing conditions with a few exceptions where we built some uh, lightweight construction over the top. And um, here's the section. So the building had to open up to the north. So we took the gable and morphed it to the north and allowed the winter sun to penetrate because the house next door did cast quite deep shadows. We obviously had to have a cross ventilation strategy and heat stack, really, really important. Passive house is great, but you still need to be able to purge. It's a really important thing. Here's the building under construction and you'll see uh, the highlight windows shooting out to the north and the rammed earth walls below and the, the building at the back section is lightweight floor and in the front it was built over the slab. So, you know, the building has um, a lot of other components to its ESD response, 11,000 litres of water storage and items such as grey water ready, food gardens and uh, no plasterboard at all. This photo is uh, interesting because it reminds me of, of the fact that I designed it before I was involved with passive house in a big way. And you'll notice that these ducts that are leading around the ceiling are very flat. Um, this is one thing that I stress. Um, we missed it. Um, it was very tight to get our ducts. We'd already got town planning. We had nowhere to move. And um, you really don't want to have to do a Houdini Act with your, uh, your services. It takes a lot of extra effort and you don't quite get the same results. So here we are, this is the building um, in its relatively finished state. It probably never be finished as it's um, my house, my family's house, and we're still working away on bits and bobs as we can afford it. And as I mentioned, there is no plasterboard. It is uh, either plywood or um, Australian hardwood finishes. And um, under this deck, it was, there's uh, 11,000 litres of water storage. We had to be very careful not to excavate so that we could save that tree off to the uh, left. Next project. This is our first real passive house. Um, this is after I'd certified. This is called the Straight House at Cape Patterson, part of an eco development. It's fully lightweight construction to reduce the embodied energy. It has um, sort of it's stepped over the landscape and um, it has uh, European timber passive house windows. The building uh, is phenomenal. It's, it's passive house certified plus and uh, it's, it's a terrific little building. Internally, uh, the client wanted it it's for an empty nester, but they have uh, adult children. So they wanted a flexibility of being able to have different spaces within the house that they could um, gravitate to, including the outdoor spaces uh, that, that were really important. I think just wait, I'll go back to that photo. So the roof form forms a, a veranda or a balcony, both at the front and the rear of the property. And if, the way we're looking on this particular picture, you can actually see Bass Strait in the distance. So a lot of analysis was done to try and um, weave our weave of view out to the uh, out to the ocean um, and similarly out this window it's a little bit overexposed but that's that's the case there this is internally this is the building there will be plants growing up in front of there that the building the ribbon windows to the north were there strategically to, to crop the views of the of what we did want to see this is our next passive house project and the challenges here um, were extremely steep site it's 14 uh, meters of crossfall on the site or uh, the views were to the south the hill was to the north they wanted universal access um, we wanted they wanted lots of water storage and food gardens and they wanted these massive rammed earth walls insulated walls so quite a quite a few challenges so we used some highlight windows um, as a strategy to bring sun deep into the space and we used the entry to become uh, a big sun capture space as you can sort of see it here i haven't got finished photos it's just moved in the landscape is not complete but yeah the, the building um, had a lot of challenges because the clients didn't quite listen to some of our recommendations and and the main thing for them was views views and 
more views. So we had to have walls of glass to the south and we managed using pH uh, software to tweak the building to get that balance between enough passive solar from the north and not too much heat loss. More views and more views. But because of this, we did encounter quite a lot of thermal bridges. And I would say dealing with thermal bridges uh, both uh, at a sort of level of steel over massive windows as well as um, connections to rammed earth walls. We needed to do more than nine thermal bridge computations or we, we engaged the consultant to do that. So um, yes, the challenges there are to really, really be careful with your thermal bridges and decide whether or not you're going to bring the steel inside or outside. These are a couple of, just to finish off, a couple of projects that are under construction at the moment. This is in Alfington, again, just to show you the different uh, architectural tectonics so you can be flexible if your client has a certain look that they're after. Uh, passive house is a system, it's not a style. So this one's in Alfington, will hopefully be complete soon. Uh, this one's in Warrandyte. Um, yeah, the, the client wanted the sort of very much uh, vernacular pavilion in the landscape. Uh, that one hopefully starts by the end of this year. This one's in Fairfield and it's um, yeah, under construction. And there's a family home with lots of, again, complicated because the client insisted on a deck um, over the living space, which introduced steel and, and um, things that we don't like. Um, this one's in Tawonga. This should start construction soon. Again, Tawonga, quite a tricky climate, super cold, not great passive uh, solar because of the uh, it's not elevated like a lot of Alpine. So it gets the coolness of Alpine. Um, but yeah, a building in Canberra would perform better. But anyway, we've got that one across the line in terms of passive house. And this one's in Mont Albert, uh, and that one is hopefully going to start construction by the end of the year. We'll see again. Uh, they wanted a pavilion which sits on a very awkward shaped block. But anyway, I go on and on. I said what we didn't know, we didn't know to start with. But what we do know is that collaboration early on is really, really important. And that is key. But the good thing is that we do know that Passive House is growing and therefore there's far more products on the market. There's more consultants, there's more help. So if you surround yourself with good people, it's, it, it's a breeze. Well, maybe not a breeze, but it's certainly a lot easier. The uplift costs are re reducing massively. I think Talena will touch on that. It's, it is incredible to see how close you can get to the similar costs. The health outcomes we do know are there. The resilience outcomes are there. And we know that it's flexible for different types of typologies and styles. Thank you. Else, uh, Luke, can you please stop sharing your screen? Oh, yep, yeah, stop sharing screen. So <laughs> we'll do that. That's okay. Thank you so much. It's so great to see your journey, Luke. That's really cool. Um, and thank you for the invitation to share a bit about our similar journey, because it's often I find with the Passive House community, everyone is so generous at sharing what they've learned, mistakes they've made to really lift the whole industry up. So, yeah, thank you again um, for, for sharing that. Uh, I'm Talina, and I'm proud to be speaking here today from Wadarung country, the traditional owners of the land where I live and work. And I pay my deep respects to elders past, present and emerging for their continued care and custodianship and connection to country. And today we're talking about good design and because we're in a climate and biodiversity emergency and feel that good enough is not good enough anymore. And yeah, thanks to everything that Luke has explained about that too. So in the same spirit, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. And so that's sort of what this is all about. And in terms of where I'm coming from, our business is Envirotexture, which is Envirotexture aligned with nature. So it is all around healthy homes for people and planet. And we really do see that Passive House plays a key role in this. 
But of course, the journey to more good design is not about perfection. Um, I'm sure we've seen versions of this before. It's definitely not a straight line, um, as Luke has illustrated as well. There's a lot of um, lessons to learn along the way, but we can fast track this if we learn from each other. And again, the benefits of the Passive House Standard, once people learn about it, it just makes sense. When you can have um, high levels of energy efficiency, um, we're really then reducing that um, operational energy. We've got the thermal comfort. Where I am here in central Victoria, it gets bloody cold and bloody hot. And clients are always complaining about this. And this is a way we could guarantee we knew um, how much heating, how much cooling, um, how, how well the house would work. Because what we learned was that the star rating wasn't necessarily giving us all the answers we needed. So we know we can have that occupant health and well-being with indoor air quality is um, you know, as Luke's touched on, we know there's low condensation, we're eliminating toxins, we've got low particulate matter. We can ensure that that is happening, uh, which is what's happening around the rest of the world. Uh, we know that we can get a good return on investment. It's resilient. And, and the quality assurance, that stamp of approval is what really brings people to it. And I am focusing on residential projects today because this is the journey through with most of us as we're getting into Passive House, but it can be all building types and styles, all climates. There's over 120,000 certified projects around the world, but there's many more places where this is just code. This is standard. Um, and the other thing which I'll be touching on is it, of course, it's very compatible with natural building materials and low embodied carbon um, and treating that as part of the equation as well. So really, basically, um, just in case anyone is still new to this, with passive house principles, we are still using solar passive design, super important, especially with orientation and shading. We want to know where the sun is. We want to know where the wind is. But in, in addition, we want that excellent insulation that is continuous without the gaps. And we do put in a mechanical ventilation system, which is no different to having a washing machine or a dishwasher in your house. It's really common in other parts of the world. Um, and we're putting it in one of our projects now because you get that indoor air quality and health aspect guaranteed. Uh, there is an airtight building envelope um, to ensure that we are separating the outdoor air from the indoor air, because this is what we are trying to do to keep it, um, our optimal temperatures. And we're eliminating those thermal bridges at the junctions wherever possible. And of course, we have really good windows and we're finding in our climate, we are always going for triple glaze because they are the equivalent insulative value of R1 and our walls here, the code says need to be R4. Well, only just now, if you're moving to seven stars, we want R4 in the walls, which is 140 thick. So our modeling, once we do our PHPP modeling that Luke was touching on, when we do that, we're finding in a lot of climates, we need double that. So it depends on a lot of factors, but we need to do that modeling and we use it as a design tool because it tells us so much. And a lot of the projects today I'm focusing on are here in Victoria, but I've got some of our New South Wales projects as well. Um, and yeah, we're working across Australia. And before I go any further, I feel like this is the dumbest question ever. Can I open the windows? Yes, yes, and yes is the answer. You can open your windows in an airtight house whenever you like. Um, people are still, I have architects still asking me this um, and it's time to dispel this myth because of course you can, but if it's too hot outside or the dust is blowing or there's bushfire smoke, you want to keep them closed. Or if it's freezing, you want to keep them closed. But when they are closed, you know that you can still enjoy the views and the connection outside like my client Pipia um, without, without worrying. So it's the best of both worlds. But yeah, let's dispel this myth once and for all. So again, a little bit of a journey through some case studies. This was one of the first projects I did when I started my own business about 10 years ago, prior to my merger with Envirotecture two years ago. So this was back when it could be six star nat hers was the best thing you could get. And we we're all about solar passive design. Um, this one had some beautiful round earth. Look at those views uh, on this particular site. All the views were to the west. But we also wanted to have um, really good north facing windows. So we did all the right things that we thought were right at the time. And, uh, uh, you know, the list was all, all, all the things you would do for Nat Hers to get a really high six star rating, which we thought was brilliant. Um, and we had hydronic heating in the insulated slab and, um, you know, the clients had access to trees and burning firewood. So they did that and they put in a, a wood fire heater as well. And um, I think it was gas boosted um, 
solar, uh, sorry, gas boosted hot water with a sol solar hot water. And they did have gas cooking because it was still, still knew that we were moving to all electric homes. And it was very hard to find anyone who would do a heat pump hot water. So, you know, this wasn't that long ago, but the list of things about, you know, if I knew then what I know now, which is what Luke was talking about as well, I'm not going through um, any um, graphs or data, but had I had my time again, like, you know, this is a, a lovely, comfortable home. It, it's it's beautiful. It, you know, performs pretty well. They, they use their heating. Um, they have all those views. But had we had our time again, we would have definitely um, been looking at air tightness, triple glazing. We had this beautiful airlock entry because, you know, that's what we used to think we needed. With Passive House, we don't need that anymore. Um, and look, we love this round earth, but they're causing big thermal bridges from inside to out. It was insulated round earth, but I learned that, you know, that's such a thin sandwich of insulation in those panels and it's not the whole way through. So we thought we were trying to do all of the good things um, but we just, we were only just starting to learn about the certified passive house standard at the time. Um, one of the next projects, and sorry, that photo now looks a little bit blurry. This one hasn't been professionally photographed yet. This about to do stage two, but this one, we got up to, um, you know, seven and a half Nat Her stars and we went, woohoo, we're doing great. And it was all about permaculture pavilions, um, because that's, this is what the, the clients are really into, um, and we've got, you know, beautiful triple glazing that's clearly north facing. You can see it's not quite finished um, in, in that photo. Um, it, it's a really lovely home where they were all about using local stone, um, some beautiful um, reclaimed timber. So again, clients who really wanted to do all the right things, but we were looking at this point in time um, to get uh, some passive house modeling done. There wasn't a lot of people doing it. It was quite Expensive. The client said, nah, it's okay. We are really great at managing our own ventilation. We promise we will do that. <laughs> um, so we haven't had a blower door test or anything like that. Um, but without doing that modeling, all we knew was that it was seven star, sorry, seven and a half stars, which is awesome. But they are using their hydronic heating in the slab regularly because it's a big space and this climate where this is gets really cold. Um, like you know, <laughs> spine tingling kind of freezing. Um, it's in Gordon halfway up the road from Melbourne to Ballarat. And they did put an air source heat pump hydronic system in. And at the time, that is not a cheap system to install, but they did that because they, they wanted to make it work. Um, you know, it has a green roof, roof um, over the entry. It has lots of good stuff. But really, um, had we had our time again, we'd want to have checked um, those thermal bridge calculations because of the, this was a steel portal frame, which we made sure we insulated externally, all of this, but we just didn't have the data. Um, and we did manage to um, talk them out of putting the wood fire in here because it wasn't needed, but there is such this romantic sense of wanting one. Um, <laughs> in some of these cooler clients, it, it can be um, a bit of a uh, in the past, it was a battle. Now we have more and more passive house projects to prove they essentially need no heating, no cooling, um, or very little on those extremes. So this was, yeah, one of those ones right on the cusp of it was very close, but not quite. Um, this was our first certified passive house, um, oh, 2019, I think it was, um, our woods, and it also achieved a net has 7.5 star rating. Um, so it doesn't sound that great, but when you looked at the numbers, it was using, you know, less than half um, heating than, than what that said. And there was no guarantee that um, the Nat House would do that. And the main reason it got low stars was because this house had no thermal mass inside. Because when we did the passive house modeling, it said it was actually negligible about how much benefit it was um, producing. And it was just going to add a whole heap of extra cost. We don't have a slab, it's all timber framed. It was all meant to be lightweight. Um, to really reduce um, the embodied carbon that goes into concrete. Um, shading with solar passive design was super important here. You can see the, the bigger eaves and the external blinds. That is That whole elevation is north facing. But as you'll see here, the, um, the building envelope on the site that we were sort of governed by meant that we couldn't be due north. So we were tilted a little bit to the west. And that's why all of those good solar passive design principles still applied. Now, this one had a terrible form factor. Luke mentioned form factor a few times. 
This was designed before we decided on the builder and before we collectively decided, you know, the client, the builder and I to definitely go down the passive house path. So we did make a call at one point, oh, hang on, this is only borderline passive house performance. Should we squish this up and turn it into a little, you know, a rectangle? Because that would have been easier. But the clients said, no, we love these sort of outdoor courtyard spaces and these, these separations of outdoor rooms. We want to keep the design. So it did mean, though, that um, we needed a lot more insulation to all those external surfaces because that is what makes such a big difference and we're protecting the inside temperature from the outside. And my little list on the left, you know, it's it's the same as from, <laughs> from back at that first project, but all of a sudden we're now doing all electric home with heat pump hot water, induction cooktop. We've got our split system AC. So one small unit basically does the whole house, like a two kilowatt or three kilowatt system in most of our projects. Um, and often they're set to go off at, for, you know, turn on for an hour in the morning in winter, potentially, before everyone wakes up. And that's enough to just top up from the overnight lows. And that's it. They basically have, um, you know, no heating and cooling bills. And um, cooling is only on the extremes of weather, which we are putting in a, as a no-brainer now. I mean, you could get away with, with it without putting it in, but looking at climate resilience and where we're going with the temperatures, we, we're always putting it in. And usually it's runoff solar in the summer, so... It makes sense. And this is when we were also considering um, bushfire resistance. So it can all be done. But really here, it was all about form factor and how do we do that better? So we jumped to one of our Sydney um, projects, which was one of the cer first certified passive house premium projects in Australia. And this is you know, Sydney su suburban. And you can see it is a two-story box. But that's because it made it so much more affordable and efficient. Um, and, you know, there's many ways you can make a box look beautiful. This is the way that these clients um, wanted their box to look, but it just performs so well. And premium means this house is producing more energy than it's using. Um, so they've got full solar panels on the top. They've got a green roof there, productive garden. You know, they're do now doing all of the good things. Um, but we were able to model that completely in, in Passive House and make sure we've got all the good things that we had, didn't have before. So the only real learning is, yeah, how do we then um, bring in more biophilic design? There's a little bit here, but, um, you know, this is ongoing with our projects. How can we also have them, all of them um, more aligned with, with nature as well? Um, this house is finished. I don't have completed photos yet, but this was very interesting in terms of it was our first off-grid passive house, 8.7 Nathurst stars, because the walls are 300 mil thick. So they were built with LVLs during COVID lockdowns. And um, that's how much insulation we needed. And this butterfly roof, although it was, or it is lovely, um, it caused a lot of problems with getting the um, insulation right. Um, but we wanted it to still appear all lightweight and floaty and not a big sort of chunky thing. Um, and that was a big part of the design challenge. And we'd already learned about form factor, having a square box, so if you look at the, the plan here, it kind of looks like a square box because the roof is actually, you know, running around as a square, but they wanted an they wanted a fireplace and they wanted a, a conservatory sunroom that was separate to the house, but they wanted it indoors. So technically this is um, untreated or um, floor area. It is an outdoor room, but it meant they could have ooh, single glazing there, um, have their fireplace, but it's separate to the building envelope. But that then caused a lot of um, yeah, more external surfaces. And you can see um, with the little section up the top there, the amount of insulation we were putting in. So the, the roof profile is actually an awful lot more thicker than you see externally. But it, it was to illustrate that there's ways you can achieve this detailing um, that makes sense. But I, I don't know if I'll be doing a butterfly roof again in a hurry. Um, and look, this is another one where look, there's a bunch of ways you can insulate a slab, um, but we find, oh, you know, there's not always options of carbon neutral concrete, especially in regional areas. Let's hope this starts to change. But in this scenario, we did a standard um, structural slab, 100 mils of XBS insulation on top, which has got a high compressive strength. 
And then there was a screed slab on top of that because the clients, it, like there's no hydronic heating or anything in there, it doesn't need it, but it was all about having that polished concrete appearance. So it can also be done with insulation underneath a slab and it's a decoupled slab. Um, yeah, th there's different ways to do it, but these are some of the challenges we've come across in terms of how do we actually make sure that this meets um, performance for the climate. No professional photos of this one yet either soon, but I wanted to draw attention to this low energy passive house. Um, it's got this lantern roof with high level windows. It's in wood end. Um, this was all about no, a no concrete house again, except for the garage, because there was no other option <laughs> for a garage. Um, and it was all about accessibility, aging in place. It had a ton of complicated roofs. Um, which created challenges. But again, it didn't stop the design from doing what we wanted it to do. And there was an internal round earth wall, but again, that got um, removed because it, although it would have been very lovely from that, we love round earth too, Luke. In this case, um, yeah, for value management, it, it got cut out. Um, but it, it is possible we could have kept it um, if we had the budget to do so. Oh, and sorry, and this, the only reason um, it didn't quite make Passive House was because of the wood fibre insulation we were using externally. Um, the supplier couldn't get 80 mils, so they gave us two lots of 40 mils, and that meant the insulation values changed, and that was enough to drop us just below the threshold of performance. So we are often down to the line um, in this climate with um, meeting the standard, yet what we're putting like the, the thermal envelope is twice as good as what the code says it should be still. Uh, this is uh, one of our New South Wales projects, another certified passive house. I wanted to draw attention to it because it has a fire bunker underneath. That's why you see all that garage space. The, the clients also have a um, uh, horses and stables and things. So they had they wanted somewhere to store all of that in case of bushfire emergencies. And they also wanted this to be ex accessible um, to age in place. So there is um, a lift inside. So that created a whole new challenge. How do you keep that within the airtight envelope? And it basically is just outside the airtight envelope to an outdoor um, sort of terrace space. So we come across new challenges with every single project. And this is just, you know, a couple that I'm touching on very quickly, just to, um, to illustrate that, you know, we can overcome these challenges. There's always a way. Um, and, you know, one of the great things about this project and, you know, to be honest, most of our um, clients is that they are early adopters, they are taking a risk, but they really do want to leave a legacy. And we're so honoured that they they want to do, um, do better. And so that's been really great. And as Luke said, the more adopters that, that take this up, the more prices are shifting and it's becoming more affordable. Uh, moving to our Huff and Puff house in uh, regional Victoria, this has received a bit of attention of late because it's a certified passive house premium, meaning again, it's um, generating more electricity than it's using. It is off grids um, and we use these prefabricated straw bale panels to build it. So externally it's clad with um, a cemental fibre cement sheet. Other clients preferred that for uh, bushfire. You can use render externally, but the eaves would have had to change the roof, the design, everything. Uh, so we chose that externally and we rendered it internally. Um, so it's a, it's trying to tick all of the boxes once again, not just the solar passive, moving into everything that we needed um, with these beautiful triple glazed doors and everything. Um, but it also was us learning about this regenerative building ethos and living building challenge. And this project first came to me, I think, back in 2016. So back then, LBC was still quite new to me, but we were trying to implement what we could and what we knew to be um, better ways of doing things uh, back then. And this one, again, it does have concrete slab, but it was all about accessibility um, once again. And we tried to get the low carbon concrete and there was none. So constantly um yeah there's always compromise we're always pushing to go well how can we be one step better um the, this was yeah all, all the good things that went into this place to try and um, make it more regenerative and recently I gave a presentation where we said what well, what does good look like and I remembered that um I first learned about it being like a tree 
So if a house is like a tree, that's the definition of good. And I think it was William McDonough that said that. And then the Living Building Challenge obviously has that with the petals um, and that symbolism as well. So all about harvesting sun, you know, where you stand and, and water as well and, and, and giving back. So it's that's the ethos we're trying to convey, whether we're in a field or in the suburbs or in the cities. This is interesting in terms of our passive house wall types. The straw bale home you just saw is the very last, <laughs> the very last slide there. This is how thick our walls end up being because um, the straw itself is 350 mil thick. So it's very different to back at a standard sort of 90 mil wall, which is, you know, if we look at even heritage homes in in Ballarat and elsewhere, they don't even have that service cavity and there's no insulation. So this is sort of how far we've come to get all the way to here. It's like an evolution of the walls. And this is, um, yeah, nine different types, but there's there's more than this. And the point is there's no one right way. Um, there's lots of different ways you can achieve the performance. You just need to model it and see what works. I'm going to speak very quickly about a little project we did. I've only got a couple more minutes. Um, this was a competition entry um, for a True Zero Carbon Challenge, which was meant to be choose one house in one capital city and see how you could make it, you know, True Zero Carbon. And we we went a little bit too far <laughs> and did, chose to do every capital city and do four projects in each capital city. So they, um, we made a whole website about it and we've given um, presentations about this. But the whole thing was around trying to understand if we had low, medium and high embodied energy that all met passive house performance. And we did another one called Chasing Rainbows, which was what happens if you um, are just trying to get to 10 star performance, what does it really mean? And I won't go through all that data, but you can see you know, a snapshot of it there. It is all on the website. Um, we we won for Brisbane, um, but there is, um, yeah, uh, you know, different people won for different states. Brisbane got our 10 stars, but we wanted to understand, yeah, uh, should we be reaching for the stars or are we chasing rainbows? Because the performance numbers weren't quite stacking up. So this really simple 120 square metre house still had, you know, three bedrooms and a study and two, two and a half bathrooms and a living area. We wanted to see how small we could go and how it could um, work across the country. And really our main findings were around embodied carbon that once we get down to our passive house performance, then yes, embodied carbon is crucial. And what we were finding with NatHERS is there's an assumption you've got some, um, some uh, quite a bit of thermal mass in there. So we don't necessarily need that. We also found about the performance gap because seven stars in Ballarat is allowed to use twice as much heating has seven stars in Sydney. And that's just, and Threadbo, I think, can use twice as much again. So this idea of seven stars being great depends where you live and what it says. And so we're still getting people here going, well, hang on, I've got seven stars. Why am I cold? And I feel we have a responsibility to know the answer to that. Um, so we wanted this equity again around what that means in terms of star rating. And look, the, it's improving all the time and we, it's better than it was, but we've still got a, a way to go. And the other thing we realised with this research was that it, like the cost of building at the moment is expensive everywhere, but it's not the cost of building well. The, perf the performance of the thermal envelope really is like less than 20% or 25% of the total project costs, and we're seeing this everywhere. So in the scheme of things, to get that, to upgrade that thermal envelope is not a lot from that baseline of that sort of 20, 25%. So one more minute, I'm just going to throw what's happening next. We're doing a, um, a hemp house, which is this beautiful material. Oh, love it. Um, and that's targeting passive house um, as well. And we're looking at um, the sealants that help make that airtight. So watch this space. That one's gorgeous. Um, we're also doing a project in the suburbs, which is a NFIT renovation, like it's a renovation of existing building. We're putting a new two-story bit on the back. So that will meet passive house performance, but we're also going for living building challenge certification. And so again, it's all about moving from less bad to more good. It's a continuous journey. Um, so yeah, we believe that all of this is important in terms of our caring for country and um, making sure that we are aligned 
aligned with nature and providing healthier homes for uh, and you know homes that are homes and buildings that are healthier for people and planet um and the time to act is now so just do it thanks Thank you so much, um, Luke and Delena. That was brilliant. Um, you might want, if you can turn your camera on too, Luke, so we might go through a couple of questions in the time that we have left. And I think it's just so fantastic that you've been so open about the process that you've been through and how it's been an evolution and what you've learned along the way. I think that's really refreshing for people that are sort of perhaps just starting out on that particular journey. I'm going to try and paraphrase a few questions so that we can kind of get through them. Um, what advice would you give to someone who is sort of interested in passive house but doesn't know where to start in terms of incorporating it into their practice? I'd say to jump on the um, APA or APA, sorry, APA website, Australian Passive House um, Association. Um, I'm no longer on the board, but um, the community there is incredible. They're doing so much advocacy work and um, the just sharing all the knowledge. So yeah, I think that's a really good place to start. Right, Luke? Yeah, I probably agree. I think that, um, yeah, maybe go to some open days and just get an understanding. I think just talking directly with someone that's designed one will give you confidence that it's not, you know, there are challenges, but it's a very different landscape now. So I really think I encourage everyone to just go, as long as you've obviously got a client that's not going to build a, a ginormous home that, that then you're right on the edge of the budget. I mean, if you're spreading the butter too thinly, it's hard to make it make it work because there is a little bit of uplifting cost, but pays back in spades. I mean, way, way, way better than 10% on your investment. And I should note that there's a, a number of uh, previous lean-ins that have been done on Passive House that people can watch for free on YouTube. And there is also formal CPD that the AIA offers as well, if you look that up. So there's some other great starting points. Um, I guess one other um, question, I'm just curious, what proportion of your clients come to you specifically because they want passive house and they've got experience um, compared to those that come for other reasons? All of them. <laughs> They all do because um, they often they have visited, like as Luke said, they've been to a Sustainable House Day or International Passive House Open Day. Highly recommend those. They are great. And there's more of my homes open all the time. Um, but they usually come already um, with a, a knowledge around it. And if they don't and we start to speak about the benefits, it's always like, well, who wouldn't want that? Like if we can make that happen and it is really hard once you do know this stuff to step back and go, what are we going to cut out? And we do have a few projects like that and it is around budget, but it's like, well, do we drop back to double glazing instead of triple? You get, like it's, it's, we don't want to cut out good windows. We don't want to cut out ventilation. It does make it really challenging to go, where do we cut back once you know what you know? Yeah, I don't see that, right? Yeah. Um, what about you, Luke? Yeah, look, I think that, yeah, there is, um, sorry, I just lost track of the question. <laughs> I, know, I was just curious to know, because, you know, there's obviously, um, you know, it's a, it's an amazing thing that you're doing. Oh, but the you're, clients, with, yeah, the clients. For business development, I'd imagine it's pretty fantastic as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we, we have clients that, yeah, once they come to your home, which is, well, we live in this home and, um, and yeah, they, they just sort of go, I love the feel. Um, but some, we still have some that don't want certified um which but we will take them right through everything so it will be certifiable so we are doing the pressure test we're doing everything so that if they change their mind <laughs> and i've said to one of the, the people on the questions sometimes do it by stealth <laughs> yeah i'll never know thanks <laughs> i love that um, look, we are um, we are at the end of the session. Um, both Talina and Luke have very generously said that if people have more questions, that they're happy for them to reach out to them um, to have a chat. As I said, there's lots of other resources. I would like to thank everybody so much for joining today and a reminder that this lean-in has been re recorded to view later and you can get notifications of where new lean-ins are available to view by subscribing to the Australian Institute of Architects YouTube channel, uh, YouTube at Oz Architects, and that's where those other sessions are also available. Um, thank you again, Luke and Talina. That was sensational. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks. Bye.